Good afternoon, everybody. We've got a full house today. Let me just do a quick statement at the top, and then we'll uh, move to your questions. Uh, obviously, a lot has happened since uh, we all convened in this room six days ago. Uh, most importantly, uh, the terrible terror attacks that we saw in Paris last week. And I expect that we'll have ample opportunity to talk about that uh, over the course of this briefing today. However, before we do, let me also note something else important that happened, uh, which is that House Republicans put forward Department of Homeland Security funding legislation uh, through the end of fiscal year 2015. Unfortunately, Republicans have also unveiled plans to muck around with that legislation. This is legislation that funds our efforts to protect our ports and our borders. It provides aviation security. It bolsters our cybersecurity. It coordinates with state and local authorities to improve our counterterrorism resilience in communities across the country. And yes, it enforces our immigration laws. There's never a good time for Republicans to do something like this. But right now, it seems like a particularly bad time for them to do so. Republicans have said they are doing this because they have a political or ideological objection to the president's executive action on immigration. So let me repeat what you've heard me say before. The president's plan would bring some badly needed accountability to our immigration system by requiring undocumented workets, workers, I'm sorry, undocumented immigrants who have been in this country for more than five years to come out of the shadows, get right with the law, submit to a background check, and pay taxes. The Republican plan would undo all of that and send the country back in the direction of doing nothing, which is something that uh, no less an authority than Marco Rubio has said uh, is amnesty. So uh, I guess that means that there's probably a lot of reasons to think that what Republicans are planning uh, on the DHS funding bill uh, is a bad idea. So with that, Jim, do you want to get started with questions today? Thanks, Josh. Just to follow up on that, does that sure. so the President would veto uh, this legislation that the House is Assembly. Well, we've made clear, dating back to last fall, uh, that the President would oppose any uh, legislative effort to undermine uh, the executive actions that he took to add greater accountability to our immigration system. So, yes. Um, can you tell us uh, anything about this uh, hacking of CENTCOM, uh, how disruptive is it? Do you, do you have any information on it? That you can do? Uh, Jim, I don't have a lot of uh, information on this. It, it just occurred, you know, within the last hour or so. Uh, I can tell you this is something that uh, we're obviously looking into and something that we take seriously. Uh, however, just a, you know, a note of caution to folks as they're covering this story, uh, there's a pretty diff significant difference between um, what is a, um, a large data breach uh, and the hacking of a Twitter account. So we're still uh, examining and investigating uh, the extent uh, of this incident, uh, but um, uh, but I don't have any information uh, beyond that for you. On the uh, topic du jour, um, why did uh, either <laughs> President Obama or Vice President Biden or Eric Holder attend the Paris Solidarity March this summer? Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, I can tell you that what was on the television screens of people uh, across this country and I think even across the globe uh, was a remarkable display of unity. Uh, by the French people uh, in the face of these terrible terror attacks. And the way that that country has come together, I do think, uh, struck a chord and inspired people all across uh, the world and uh, throughout this country. Uh, it was a remarkable display. Uh, there were also another of, uh, a number of other world leaders who were there to participate and show their support as well. Uh, and some have asked whether or not the United States should have sent someone with a higher profile than the ambassador to France. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that we should have sent someone with a higher profile uh, to, to be there. Uh, that said, there is no doubt uh, that the American people and this administration stand four square behind our allies in France uh, as they face down this threat. And that was evident throughout last week when you saw that the President's top counterterrorism advisor here at the White House was in touch with her French, French counterpart minutes after this, uh, the report to this terror attack uh, first emerged. Uh, you saw later in the day that the President of the United States telephoned President Hollande to not just express his condolences on behalf of the American people to the people of France, but also to pledge any needed uh, cooperation and assistance uh, to conduct the investigation and to bring to justice those who are responsible uh, for those terror attacks. Uh, I can tell you that that kind of coordination that is the backbone of the strong relationship between the United States and France uh, continues. It continued throughout the weekend uh, and it continues today. Uh, in fact, I can tell you that the French ambassador to the United States uh, will be here at the White House later today to meet with 
uh, Lisa Monaco, who is, as I mentioned earlier, is the President's top uh, counterterrorism advisor. How much higher a profile do you think should have, or does the President think should have been there? Eric Holder was in the city, did uh, television talk show shows that morning. Should he have been the, the person representing the U.S.? Or at what level does the pre would the President have been satisfied with the yeah. President? Well, I can tell you, Jim, that had the circumstances be a little bit, been a little bit different, I think the President himself would have liked to have had the opportunity to be there. Uh, the, the, well, uh, well, the fact is that this is uh, uh, obviously a, a march that uh, the planning for which only began on Friday night, uh, and 36 hours later it had uh, begun. Uh, the, what's also clear is that the security requirements around a presidential level visit or even a vice presidential level visit uh, are onerous and significant. And uh, in a situation like this, they typically have a, a pretty significant impact on the other uh, citizens who are trying to participate in a large uh, public event like this. We talk about this a lot when it comes to, uh, you know, the president attending a, uh, a basketball game. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, there were not just thousands of people at the event, there were millions. Uh, there, it wasn't just a, an arena that needed to be secured, uh, but a large outdoor area that poses significant uh, security challenges. Uh, I'm confident that the professionals at the Secret Service could overcome those challenges, uh, but it would have been very difficult to do so without significantly having, impacting uh, the ability of common citizens uh, to participate in this march. And after all, what I think uh, was so impressive about this display is it demonstrated the unity of the French people. Uh, and uh, that is something uh, that we uh, are always mindful of in situations like this, uh, of interfering with those who are trying to attend an event, particularly when the purpose of the event uh, is to demonstrate the unity uh, of spirit and purpose uh, of the people who are coming together. This, this consideration of perhaps having had a uh, a more prominent presence there. Is that something that just has been considered at the White House today, or was it something you considered doing on Friday when you first know, knew that uh, this was going to happen? Well, Jim, I'm, I'm not going to sort of uh, unpack all of the of the planning and discussions that uh, went into this, but I, I think, um, you know, suffice it to say there uh, should not be and there is not any doubt uh, in the minds of uh, the people in France uh, or people around the world, and certainly not among our enemies, uh, about how uh, committed uh, to a strong relationship that the United States is with France and committed to the same kinds of values uh, that they are. Uh, I think in some ways, most importantly, the people who understand this best of all uh, are the French people themselves. Uh, and I did note that the French ambassador was on television earlier today in which he described the French people as overwhelmed by the expression of, solid, of solidarity and grief uh, from all corners of the American people, including from the highest levels of the administration. Okay. Just, Steve? Just to follow up a little bit, did, did you consider having the president go, or was it something that was just developing too late to... Well, see, as I mentioned to Jim, I'm not just going to, I'm just not going to be in a position to sort of unpack the, the scheduling planning discussions that uh, we have here. Uh, but what I can tell you is, uh, you know, that there are some who have suggested that the uh, U.S. presence at the march should have been represented by somebody uh, with a higher profile than the ambassador to France. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that um, uh, we here at the White House uh, agree that somebody with a higher profile should have uh, also included. And did the French ask you to come? Uh, I, uh, Steve, I, I'm not aware of all of the, it, all of the con uh, conversations that may have occurred between uh, French officials and American officials here. There's been plenty of criticism about this. Is this criticism fair? Well, uh, criticism from whom? A, a wide variety of, I mean, everybody. But nobody that comes to mind? Well, I've seen. Well, I can give you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. It's your turn to ask a question, so you can. Ted Cruz. Um, Ted Cruz. Jake Tapper. Mm -hmm. um, Jake Tapper did have some criticism. I saw that too. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Marco Rubio. Uh, Rubio. Mm -hmm. Throw out some names. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are the Republicans too. Right. So, Steve, you're asking. Is this criticism fair? Mm -hmm. uh, it is certainly a free country, and people have the opportunity to um, subject the. Uh, uh, their elected officials to uh, criticism and make it clear when they uh, disagree with uh, a decision or an action that's been taken by the administration, and I certainly wouldn't quibble uh, with their right to do so. And to the extent that there are those who are out there saying uh, that the administration should have sent someone with a higher profile to participate in the march, uh, I guess what I'm saying is that, uh, that uh, we agree that we should have sent someone with a higher profile, uh, uh, again, in addition to the, uh, the ambassador to France.
Let me just ask one last thing sort of related to this. Uh, President Hollande has called the Paris attacks an act of war. How does this change the, your strategy toward going after Islamic State? Are the French now going to be stronger partners? Or how do you interpret this? Well, I, there's a, 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 an important leap that's uh, made in the construct of the question there, which is uh, there still is an investigation that's ongoing to determine uh, exactly what the links were between uh, these individuals who were responsible for these terror attacks in France uh, and their communications and support from uh, extremists in other locations around the globe. There's some reporting, public reporting that I'm referring to that indicates uh, that uh, that these individuals may have had links to or even traveled to Yemen. Uh, I know that there is a, uh, an in, a video that's emerged today that we're still reviewing here in which one of the terrorists indicate uh, some sympathy and support from ISIL. So, you know, we're reviewing all of this and trying to, to assist the French as they take the lead on the investigation, as they should, uh, about who is responsible, what kind of support they had, uh, and what links that has to other extremist groups around the world. Okay, move around just a little bit. Laura. Thank you, merci. How did the president follow the demonstration yesterday, and what was his personal feeling when he was looking at all those American channels airing the demonstration for hours? Yeah. Well, uh, Laura, I, I don't know how much of the, the, the march the president watched on television, but I can tell you that uh, you know, the comments that I have reiterated today about uh, the rather impressive display of unity and solidarity from the French people uh, is something that the President made note of as well. Uh, and, um, you know, these are, these are messages that were most importantly sent by the citizens of France, uh, but they were echoed by people all across the globe. And there are many ways that people could demonstrate that those expressions of support, everything from uh, an op-ed to a tweet to a, a speech at the Golden Globes Awards last night. And I think that is indicative of the kind of solidarity that the American people feel with our allies in France, not just because of the terrible tragedy that they've endured, but also because of the kinds of values that they fight for. These are the same kinds of values that we hold dear in this country. And I think that's why the bond between the United States and France uh, is so strong today. The session began at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in Paris. The White House sent a message at 7 o'clock in the morning here by email. You were saying that there will be a summit to uh, fight uh, violence extremism. What is your point there? What do you expect from this summit? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me say a couple of things about that. This, uh, this effort to counter violent extremism is something that we've, we've talked about quite a bit uh, over the years. Uh, this has long been a focal point of our planning. Uh, when it comes to our counterterrorism strategy. Uh, the other thing that I would anticipate that we would expect to um, discuss in the context of this summit uh, is to invite leaders from the private sector and technology community uh, to discuss how extremists are using social media platforms um, to try to inspire uh, acts of violence. Uh, and to inspire uh, extremism, expressions of extremism, uh, by other people. Uh, and we want to talk about strategies that we can employ to better promote pluralism, inclusion, uh, and resilience in communities all across the country. Uh, one of the other things that we would expect that we would talk about uh, in the summit like this would be to highlight the experience of some pilot programs that have been operating in cities like Boston, Los Angeles, and uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, where local officials have really um, uh, employed some pioneering techniques to try to work very closely uh, in their communities to, again, uh, root out efforts to inspire and recruit uh, extremists or to propagate extremist ideology uh, in a way that's not good for the country and certainly isn't good for the communities where that may be occurring. So uh, there are some very interesting innovative techniques that are being employed, and we want to share those best practices with other local uh, officials who'd participate in the summit. You speak about the battle against Islamist extremism. Mm -hmm. Well, I, all forms of, of, uh, of violent extremism would uh, certainly be discussed in the context of this summit. But uh, obviously, the you know the threat that we see from uh, um, you know violent extremism that's uh, in which individuals uh, invoke the name of Islam, otherwise a, an otherwise peaceful religion, uh, in uh, you know as they carry out these attacks, would certainly be the uh, obviously a, a priority in the discussion here. Okay. Ed. Jeff, why wouldn't you use the phrase right there that we are going to take on Islamic extremism? 
You said all forms of violent extremism. What are, well, because she asked me what the summit would discuss, and all forms of violent, uh, violent extremism would be uh, discussed. And obviously, uh, the most potent and certainly the most um, uh, you know, graphic display that we've seen in recent days is, uh, again, is, is motivated by those individuals that seek to invoke the name of Islam to carry out these violent attacks. And that's uh, certainly something that we want to work very hard to counter and mitigate. And we've got uh, a strategy that we've been discussing for some time to so exactly do that. Most potent form, according to you, of extremism. Why isn't it the summit on countering Islamic extremism? Uh, because violent extremism is something that we want to be focused on. And it's not just uh, uh, it's not just uh, Islamic violent extremism that we want to counter. There are other forms of Paris, Australia, Canada. Isn't the thread through them that it's Islamic extremism? Mm -hmm. well, well, certainly those I, all the examples that you cite are examples of individuals who have cited Islam as they've carry out, carry, carried out acts of, uh, of violence. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no arguing that. Um, you said several times we should have sent someone higher than the ambassador. I haven't With a higher profile than higher the ambassador, profile. that's correct. Question. Why didn't you? Mm -hmm. Well, Ed, I've, I've sort of tried to describe to you exactly um, the situation here, that there, we're talking about an, a march that came together with essentially 36 hours notice, um, and a march that occurred outdoors with uh, an obviously very large uh, number of people who participated. Um, we are mindful anytime the president goes to a public place, or the vice president for that matter, that we don't want to, or at least we want to try to mitigate the impact uh, that the security precautions would have on those who are participating in this public event. Uh, and there's no doubt that had the, had the president or vice president on this very short time frame gone to participate in this event that took place outdoors with uh, more than a million people in attendance, uh, that it would have significantly impacted the ability of, of those who are attending the march to participate in the way that they did yesterday. Everyone in this room would acknowledge the president's safety is of utmost. It's not an issue at all. Of course, his security is important and you don't want to detract from the event. How do you explain then that the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, he made it there? He, he's a huge target, obviously, unfortunately. Well, I will allow the Israelis to discuss what security precautions they Dozens had in place. Of leaders. Dozens okay. of leaders from a, a countries that are very important. They're not America, but very important. How, how did they make, they, they make it there? How did they make it there? Ed, you should talk to them about the security precautions they have in place. You've been to enough, look, you have been to enough sure. events where the president is attending a, a conference or a summit with other world leaders, and I think that you uh, have seen firsthand that's, that the security precautions that are in place for the President of the United States, this has been true of previous presidents too, uh, are sometimes more onerous than the precautions that are put in place for other world leaders. In the Mandela funeral, there are dozens and dozens of leaders. The American security might be more, but it comes up in short notice. Unfortunately, Mandela dies, and you wanted to be there. You made it. Well, How did that come together? The, the difference with, uh, with uh, President Mandela, Mandela is that there had uh, been discussions that have been ongoing for, frankly, a number of years. Uh, about the ceremony that would take place in the event of his death. Uh, and so there was a, a, a much clearer, that's right, but there was a much clearer uh, a plan that was already in place that could be followed for executing that event on a tort, short time frame. There obviously was nothing uh, in place because I don't think anybody contemplated the kind of attack uh, that we saw in Paris. Once you said the president personally wishes he, he would have liked to have gone. Uh, why didn't he? What was he doing on Sunday? We haven't gotten an accounting of what the president did Sunday. Yeah, I, I, I haven't spoken to the president about what he did yesterday. So. I mean, you obviously prepared for this, and uh, you've said many times the most transparent administration. What was the president doing? Yeah. And I, I guess I prepared for a lot of questions today, but I did not prepare but, uh, for a question for based on what the president, president was actually was doing, doing yesterday. Didn't pre okay. Uh, Attorney General Eric Holder was in Paris, and they put out a statement in his office saying that he had very important meetings. No one would counter that the counter-terror meetings were very important. One would assume that the French officials who attended those meetings, some of them anyway, probably went to this rally. And the Attorney General's office says that he had to get back to Washington on Sunday afternoon. That was one reason why he couldn't make the rally. Why couldn't the Attorney General? He was in that city, so there's no issue of... Security was already in place. How could he not attend? Yeah. And I'm not aware of the details of the uh, Attorney General's schedule for yesterday. Um, but if you are asking whether or not somebody like the Attorney General should have attended or should have been asked by the White House to attend, what I'm telling you is that, yes, we believe somebody with a higher profile uh, should have been asked to attend. The what about this rally in D.C.? There was a rally, I believe it was a march from the museum to the French Embassy. We should note the President did go to the French Embassy last week, obviously. He signed a condolence book. He expressed his solidarity with the French people. But I understand the President is probably not going to go marching through the streets of D.C., yeah. but the White House Chief of Staff, <coughs> the Vice President, a Cabinet Secretary somewhere, how, how mm -hmm. come you didn't have someone in D.C. at a rally? Yeah. 
Well, uh, and I know that there were a number of administration officials that did participate in that rally. I think a lot of them are in that march, and I think a lot of them participated, uh, you know, would have done so even if they weren't uh, members of the administration. But, uh, you know, I can tell you, Ed, that for all of the uh, for all of this talk, there is no doubt, and there should be no doubt, uh, about this commitment of the administration and the commitment of the American people to standing shoulder to shoulder with our allies in France uh, as they deal with the aftermath of these terrible terrorist attacks and as they continue the fight for the kinds of values that we hold so dear on both sides of the Atlantic. Okay. Justin. Um, I want to talk about cyber, but I had a question on the uh, anti-extremism summit. It had been originally scheduled for October, or it was mm -hmm. supposed to be in October, and then it seemed like it was delayed a couple of times. Could you just talk about why, why that was delayed, why it didn't happen back in October? Well, there are, um, there have been a number of discussions about how exactly, um, about how this was going to come together and trying to schedule uh, among uh, state and local leaders, leaders in the private sector, uh, community leaders from other places uh, across the country is difficult. Uh, but I guess I can say that what I would say is that this is something that we've been focused on uh, for quite some time, that this notion of countering violent extremism has been a central focal point of our counterterrorism strategy for a long time, dating back to February uh, of 2010. Uh, when then Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and current CIA Director John Brennan uh, gave a speech at NYU's Islamic Center uh, and the Islamic Law Students Association at NYU, uh, where they discussed uh, the need to counter uh, efforts to recruit people in the name of violent extremism and the efforts and the need to work closely with local law enforcement and with community leaders uh, to try to, uh, uh, to counter that message. When incidental, like you were just able to corral everybody, or, or was Paris kind of an impetus that enabled you to bring people in for this this meeting next month? Well, the I guess what I would say is that this you know, certainly the, um, the 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 tragic events that we saw in Paris last week uh, are a reminder of how important it is for us to be vigilant about this specific issue, uh, and you know this is uh, this summit as I described earlier will be uh, an important opportunity for us. Uh, to talk about some of the strategies that we have in place uh, to mitigate the messages that are emanating uh, in social media to try to recruit uh, people in the name of violent extremism. And uh, we certainly also look forward to the opportunity to hearing from local officials and leaders of communities all across the country uh, about how they've worked together uh, in a way uh, to mitigate those messages and to counter them. And uh, it should be an opportunity for those kinds of best practices to be shared with local officials from all across the country that will participate in this event. And on cyber, the president said today that he's going to announce legislation tomorrow to encourage collaboration between uh, companies and the government on uh, cybersecurity practices and, and information. It sounds a lot like CISPA, which is the legislation that's been kind of languishing on Capitol Hill for a couple of years. Um, you guys had voiced concerns about that before, so I'm wondering, has that changed, or are we going to hear a different version of that legislation tomorrow? Well, we'll, uh, we'll save tomorrow's news for tomorrow. But uh, you have heard me say on a number of occasions uh, that we've been pretty disappointed that Congress has not fulfilled the responsibility that they have to deal with this critically important issue. Uh, and that's why you heard the President talk a little bit today uh, about some legislative proposals that he's going to send up in the name of, of uh, strengthening consumer, consumer protections uh, and making sure that consumers and students get the kind of protection and assurances that they deserve uh, when it comes to their privacy. Uh, we would hope that that would not be something that would get bogged down in partisan debates. This is something we should all be able to agree on. We'll see. Uh, I think the same thing, uh, same description could apply to this kind of cybersecurity legislation that the President looks forward to talking about tomorrow. Uh, but for the details of that, we'll, uh, we'll have more on that for you. Well, yeah, Senator Thune, I mean, issued a statement today saying that the President had gone kind of absent on these cybersecurity measures. I think I asked you a couple weeks ago if you guys were bringing people in for briefings or, or pushing this type of thing. Um, one of the proposals the President <coughs> unveiled today, actually, is kind of a recast of this 2011 uh, proposal. Now it's 30 days instead of 60 days to trigger uh, a data breach notification. So why, why is it going to be different, and what are you guys going to do differently this time to, to kind of encourage it to move on the hill? Mm -hmm. Well, I do think that certainly in the aftermath of uh, some of the more recent cyber attacks that we've seen that have uh, been carried out against uh, a, a number of private companies, including most recently the uh, Sony, uh, 
Uh, hopefully that got the attention of people on Capitol Hill, that they actually need to fulfill their responsibilities to actually make progress on this issue. And the proposal that we have sent up, uh, or will send up, uh, is one that, uh, that does have the strong support of consumer groups because they recognize how important it is for companies to fulfill their obligations to communicate clearly with their consumers and their customers to make sure those customers can take appropriate steps to protect their privacy and uh, protect against identity theft. Uh, at the same time, this is also welcome news to industry because this clarity uh, associated with one specific national standard uh, would make clear to them uh, what sort of obligations they need to fulfill to their customers. Uh, right now, there's a little bit of a hodgepodge of requirements uh, that vary by state. And by putting in place uh, a tough national standard, uh, it will add some clarity to businesses and make them more effective in their response and more effective in communicating with their customers uh, in a timeline that's appropriate uh, and will ensure that customers can keep their privacy safe. Okay, John. Josh. Um Will the United States uh, take part in any retaliation uh, once it's established who was responsible uh, behind it? There, if AQAP was determined to have uh, been behind this attack in Paris, or if uh, ISIS uh, proves to have been behind it, will there be a uh, will there be a response that will include the United States? Mm -hmm. uh, John, that's uh, a, a, a possible response is not something that I'm in a position uh, to talk about uh, at this point. Uh, the two organizations that you cite are obviously under intense pressure uh, from the United States and our allies already. Uh, and um, I would anticipate that that pressure uh, will continue, but that would have been the case even if we had not seen uh, these terrible uh, terror attacks carried out last week. Uh, but you know, we're going to work closely with the French uh, as they uh, investigate exactly what happened. I know that there is uh, some information about two of the individuals that uh, the United States has been aware of and shared with our French counterparts, including uh, some information about their travel history. But uh, at this point, uh, I'm not in a position to speculate about uh, what sort of uh, response the French may decide is appropriate and what sort of role the United States would play in that response. Are we losing ground in the war on terror? I mean, we obviously have this terrible attack in Paris. Um, I asked you last week about the uh, uh, what has happened with Boko Haram uh, in Nigeria, they've gained, you know, uh, incredible territory. They've taken over a military uh, base. Um, obviously, we, we have the ongoing uh, efforts in, in Syria and in, uh, in Iraq. Um, I mean, it looks like a, it looks a lot messier out there than it did when the president was talking, you know, just a year ago about uh, decimating core Al-Qaeda and just the JV team being out there. Are we? I mean, we'll, we'll give me like a status report mm -hmm. on the war on terror. Well, there certainly are experts who are better positioned to do that than I. But let me uh, let me let me, let me give you a, a, a let me take a run at this. Our counterterrorism officials say that the biggest challenge, one of the most difficult things to detect and disrupt, uh, are attacks that are carried out by uh, lone offenders uh, or by foreign fighters. There are certainly a, a wide range of steps that we can take and are taking. Uh, I talked about some of them earlier in terms of trying to counter the extremist ideology that's propagated on social media. There certainly are steps that this administration takes to monitor the movements of individuals that have recently traveled to areas like Syria, where it's possible they may have uh, sought training uh, uh, with, uh, with militants in that region of the world. Uh, the president, as you'll recall, last fall convened a United Nations Security Council meeting where he discussed with other world leaders uh, the need to coordinate activities as we counter the threat from foreign fighters. These are individuals with Western passports that travel to Syria or Iraq. Uh, they do pose a threat when they return from that region that they may carry out acts of violence in their home countries, and that's something that we're, cognit uh, you know, that we're very aware of, uh, and it requires a very high level of coordination to monitor the movements of those uh, individuals. Uh, and you know we're going to continue to be engaged in a uh, uh, in a very high level of coordination with the French, not just as they uh, investigate this specific attack, but also as we assess the threat from uh, other individuals and other entities uh, that may be operating and may be may aspire to carry out acts of violence against uh, against Westerners or against uh, American interests. I'm asking if you look at developments over the over the past year. You look at uh, the lone wolf attacks and.
Ottawa and in Australia, you look at this attack in Paris uh, uh, by terrorists that may well be tied to, uh, to both Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula and uh, ISIS. You have what Boko Haram has done in Nigeria, and you have our inability to push uh, ISIS out of, out of Iraq. Uh, I mean, is, it does, isn't it a fair assessment to say it looks like we are losing ground or the terrorists are beginning to get an upper hand, not to mention the latest development today with uh, in a, terrorist, a terrorist group apparently, or at least they're symp sympathizers with a terrorist group, uh, taking over uh, CENTCOM's uh, Twitter account, its, uh, its YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it seems like some lost momentum, doesn't it? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't share that assessment at all, John. I mean, no. on, the, on the military side, let's just, we can run through some statistics here. Over the skies of Iraq, uh, there are now seven countries that are flying combat missions w alongside U.S. forces. Uh, in Syri still controls Mosul. Still in controls Syria, there are, are four nations that are flying with the United States. Uh, and to date, that coalition has conducted over 1,700 airstrikes against ISIL terrorists, uh, more than 960 of them in Iraq and close to 790 of them uh, in Syria. Uh, that means that regularly our coalition is taking out ISIL fighters, their commanders, hundreds of vehicles and tanks, nearly 260 oil and gas facilities. Uh, this is the infrastructure that it affects their, that uh, funds their uh, acts of terror. Uh, they've also taken out uh, more than a thousand fighting positions, checkpoints, buildings, and barracks in and around uh, in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, that's the reason that ISIL's momentum has been blunted in Iraq. Uh, and it is why their leaders are feeling more pressure than they ever have before. There is, and all of that is a testament to the uh, success that this president has had in building an international coalition to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. What's also true is that the threat that we face now is very uh, dispersed. And that does pose a set of unique challenges. Um, but there is, as tragic as the events were uh, in France last week, uh, a difference between the ability of core al-Qaeda to spend years on a conspiracy uh, involving dozens of individuals in the United States to carry out horrific attacks like they did on on September 11, 2001, uh, and the terribly violent actions of one or two or three uh, individuals. It's a different kind of threat, uh, and it is one that poses its own unique set of challenges. And it is uh, why we can talk about the success that we have had uh, in truly decimating core al-Qaeda that used to exist and operate with impunity uh, in the region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and the kind of threat that we face now from individuals who, in many cases, are being radicalized through social media uh, and carrying out either, uh, uh, you know, lone wolf attacks or are, uh, are individuals who have traveled to the region and gotten some expertise and uh, returned to the fight. Um, this is all something that we're very mindful of, and I don't, I'm not in a position to uh, downplay the risk associated with all of this, uh, but it is important to understand the kind of pressure that uh, these leading extremists or, or the individuals who are leading these extremist groups are under right now, and they're under that pressure because of the counterterrorism strategy that this administration has put in place. So if I can just do a couple quick ones on the march. You said okay. you should have sent somebody with a higher profile. Why? Yeah. Well, I guess for a couple of reasons. One is um, we want to send a clear message, even in a symbolic context like this one, uh, that the American people stand shoulder to shoulder with our allies uh, in France and sending a high level, highly visible uh, senior administration official with a high profile to that march uh, would have done that. Uh, that said, in reality, there is no doubting uh, the strong degree of support uh, and allegiance that we share uh, with the French people to the kinds of values that were under attack last week in Paris. And that is evidenced by the President's call with President Hollande, the President's visit to the French Embassy here in Washington last week, uh, the close level of, of, uh, of uh, coordination that exists between counterterrorism officials in the United States and counterterrorism officials uh, in France, and the ongoing meetings, including the one that's probably taking place right now, between the French Ambassador and the President's top uh, counterterrorism advisor. So you acknowledge it was a mistake not to send somebody higher profile to that march in Paris. Whose mistake was it? Well, John, the, uh, I'm not going to be in a position to sort of unpack all of the, the, the logistical and scheduling conversations that uh, 
have taken place here at the White House over the last several days. Uh, but what I can do is uh, a a acknowledge to you uh, that we should have sent somebody with a higher profile. Okay? Richard. Uh, I just want to go back to the summit um, in February. I just want to make it, make it clear. Are, are foreign leaders invited to the summit? Uh, I don't have a, an exact uh, invite list uh, to present at this point, but we certainly would welcome the, the participation of people from uh, other countries if they chose to do so. I think the, the focal point, however, will be uh, on the efforts that local communities uh, all across the country have undertaken to try to counter this threat uh, in their individual communities uh, and to talk about some of the strategies that the United States would employ uh, to protect, uh, to protect uh, American citizens. But I wouldn't rule out necessarily uh, that there may be an, an opportunity for uh, uh, for non-Americans to participate as well. Okay. I just want to go a little further, uh, Josh. It, it, is it a show? Are we going to try to make it a show of solidarity in front of violent uh, extremism? I see. Or is it going to be like a technical summit where people are going to come up, mm -hmm. foreigners or local or Americans, with their ideas and their, uh, their the thing that built up to, uh, to face this? Yeah. Uh, I would anticipate that, this, that you could describe this as a working event. This is an opportunity for us to take a very close look uh, at policies that are in place to protect the American people uh, and to review, uh, again, in very, very detailed fashion, some of the best practices that have been used by other communities uh, to uh, build strong connections between local law enforcement officials and community leaders to, uh, to protect those communities and to try to uh, counter the kind of extremist messaging that we see on social media that's targeted uh, at, at, at dis disaffected individuals. And we want to make sure that we're working with community leaders and law enforcement uh, to, to counter that messaging and to protect our communities. Okay, Alexis. Josh, two quick questions. Um, what does the President believe is the right approach to take to an English language propaganda magazine like Inspire? Because that's come up so much this weekend as enjoining and encouraging violent extremism. Well, the focal point of our countering uh, violent, ex violent extremism efforts uh, has been on uh, countering the extremist messaging that's propagated so broadly out there on the Internet. Uh, and this is a uh, unique challenge that counterterrorism officials have to deal with. As recently as, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, this is obviously not much that they had to contemplate because the, you know, the, the Internet wasn't so well developed. Uh, and so this does pose a pretty unique challenge. And um, it's one that uh, we spend a lot of time working on. Uh, let me tell you a couple of, uh, of ways in which we have um, uh, tried to counter this. The first is by encouraging moderate voices, particularly in the, uh, in the Muslim community, uh, to speak up and speak out against this. Uh, that, as Muslim leaders would tell you, those who have studied and practiced this religion would tell you, uh, Islam is a peaceful religion. Uh, and it, the kinds of violent acts that are advocated in the, in the outlet that you have described uh, is entirely inconsistent with the basic principles of that peaceful religion. And what's important is not just for me to stand up here and say that, but for respected leaders in the Muslim community to come forward and say that, uh, not just in the United States but around the world. And there are, have been religious leaders in other countries uh, that have issued religious edicts uh, outlawing uh, this kind of, uh, of extremism and violence. And uh, that is helpful uh, in this effort. You know, the second thing that I think is worth noting, and this goes a little bit to, uh, to John's question, I guess, is that the original author of this publication uh, has been wiped off the battlefield. Uh, and again, that is a, a testament to uh, the, kinds of, the kind of pressure uh, that these terrorist leaders are under, that they are being watched, that they're being monitored, and they are at risk whenever they are out uh, operating uh, publicly, even when they're operating publicly uh, in a place like Yemen that seems uh, really far away. But uh, we recognize the threat that these individuals face, and because of the counterterrorism strategy that this president has put in place, those extremist leaders are under intense pressure, uh, and many of them have been wiped off the battlefield. To follow up, because the creator of Inspire is dead, is the president concerned just that the statement that you just made, that the, the messengers will be killed, has itself been an inspiration to violent extremism? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Alexis, I guess the, the alternative is, would, should we have 
uh, not taken the strike uh, to take out uh, those extremist leaders. Uh, that's certainly not a decision that the President arrived at, but if there are people who want to second guess uh, that strategy, they're welcome to do so. Uh, but the President certainly believes that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that keeping applying military pressure on terrorist leaders uh, and killing them when we have the opportunity uh, is a good counterterrorism strategy. It's about tomorrow's meeting with leaders, the congressional leaders. Um, is the President's goal to talk to them about the areas in which they differ because of the discussion in the past few days about the number of veto threats? Or is his goal to talk to them about what they have in common? I certainly think that there's been uh, uh, adequate attention given to those areas where we disagree. The President's looking forward to a robust, constructive discussion on those areas where we do agree. Uh, they do exist. Uh, and the President is looking forward to talking about them. That said, there, do, there, uh, there continues to be some areas where we disagree uh, but on things that actually are priorities, and that uh, you know, one of those areas is uh, legislation that would ensure that the Department of Homeland Security uh, is adequately funded through the end of this fiscal year. Uh, I don't know yet whether or not that would come up in the meeting, but uh, we'll try to give you a, a readout of the meeting after it's taken place. Okay. Major. Judge, uh, AQAP asserted that it was behind the original attack in Paris. Does the administration, based on what it knows, have any reason to doubt that? Well, Major, I, I can tell you that there is information about this investigation uh, and about these individuals that we have shared with uh, French investigators. They are, after all, in the lead in this investigation. This terrible act took place on their soil, and they should take responsibility for uh, investigating it, determining uh, who was responsible and what kind of support they had. Uh, so we have shared um, we have shared information with our French counterparts uh, on this matter, but it's not information that I'm prepared to discuss from here. Does the administration have any verification of the reports that started to come out of Nigeria on Friday about a potential massacre of up to 2,000 carried out by Boko Haram? Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly are uh, aware of those reports, and there were some other, um, frankly, disturbing reports of violence out of uh, Nigeria over the weekend as well. Uh, you know, we do continue to be concerned uh, about, about that situation, and, uh, you know, we're going to continue to work uh, with the uh, Nigerian government uh, on our counterterrorism efforts. Uh, at the same time, we're also going to continue to urge uh, the Nigerian government to live up to some basic uh, human rights and some basic hu principles of human rights uh, that sometimes get uh, um, uh, overlooked uh, out of, uh, you know, an effort to try to fight this, uh, this terrible terrorist scourge they're dealing with in their country right now. Um, but, you know, the United States is going to continue to, uh, to monitor these events and continue to work with, uh, with Nigeria on this. The numbers could be as high as so far reported and that this could be a massacre of significant dimension? Uh, I don't have uh, uh, any, uh, any assessment on this outside of the public reporting on, on this that I've seen. Okay. Uh, is it fair to assume that what you're telling us without saying it directly, which I'll try to get you to do, is that the Attorney General is the one who missed the opportunity because he was there and could have come to a different conclusion about his whereabouts when the march occurred? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm not suggesting that, that, um, that anybody bears responsibility of this outside the White House. The, the White House has to make a decision about who's going to represent uh, the administration and the American people at a march like this, and that's where that, uh, that decision lies. And it's, uh, uh, the White House should have made a different decision. We here at the White House should have made a different decision. Did that decision rise to the level of the President himself? It did not. What level did it rise to? Uh, I'm not going to get into, as I mentioned to Steve. But the President uh, was not presented with this decision. Uh, this is not a decision that was made by the President. Um, your predecessor from this podium in 2012 was asked about one of the cartoons published by Charlie Hebdo. And he said, representing the President and this administration, that the White House questioned the judgment of the publication of that particular cartoon. Not that it was an illegitimate act of satire, but the judgment involved behind it. Does the White House stand by that questioning of the judgment of the publication of that cartoon in light of recent events? Let me say a couple of things about that. The first is, and I, this is something I, that I don't want to be overlooked. So what, what uh, my predecessor also said in the context of those very same comments uh, was that the publication of that material did not in any way justify an act of violence. Uh, that was true then. Uh, it was true last week, and it's true today. There is nothing that the individuals uh, at that satirical magazine did uh, that justified in any way the kind of violence that we saw in Paris last week, none. That's, that is, I think, the most important principle uh, 
that's at stake here. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, it would not be the first time uh, that there has been a discussion in this country about the kinds of responsibilities that go along with exercising uh, the right to freedom of speech. Uh, and in this scenario, or in the circumstances in which uh, my predecessor was talking about this issue, there was a genuine concern that the publication of some of those uh, materials uh, could put Americans abroad at risk, including American soldiers at risk. And that is something that the Commander-in-Chief takes very seriously. Uh, and the President uh, and his spokesman uh, was not then and will not now be shy uh, about uh, expressing a view uh, or taking the steps that are necessary to try to advocate for the safety and security uh, of our men and women in uniform. But advocating and taking steps to protect American service personnel is different than criticizing or raising questions about the judgment underlying any satirical <coughs> expression, be it to mock Islam or Christianity or Judaism or anything else. Where do you draw the line? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it depends on the scenario. Uh, I but think... It's not an absolute support <coughs> well, or satirical mockery of any institution on this planet? I think there are a couple of absolutes. The first is, is that the publication of any kind of material in no ways justifies any act of violence, let alone an act of violence that we saw on the scale in Paris. Uh, and there is v this president, as the commander in chief, believes strongly in the responsibility that he has to advocate for our men and women in uniform, particularly if it's going to make them safer. Uh, and the president takes very seriously his responsibility as commander in chief to do that. Uh, and that's something that we're going to continue to do uh, in the future. Those are the absolutes, uh, or at least two of them. Um, but, you know, when we are confronted with these kinds of scenarios where we're balancing, uh, you know, basic rights uh, alongside very important responsibilities that must also be exercised, uh, it's going to always depend on the scenario. Uh, but what won't change uh, is our view that that freedom of expression in no ways justifies an act of violence against the person who expressed a view. Uh, and the President uh, considers the safety and security of our men and women in uniform uh, to be something worth fighting for. And lastly, uh, do you believe the French in any way feel slighted or insulted by the lack of a higher profile U.S. presence yesterday? Uh, I don't. Uh, and if you believe the public words of the French ambassador to the United States, who described himself and the French people as overwhelmed by the expression of solidarity from the American people, including the President of the United States, uh, the French people certainly don't feel that way. So you're apologizing because you're being criticized? Well, I think we're, uh, what I'm acknowledging is that we should have done something differently. Uh, and this is uh, uh, an opinion that's been expressed by a lot of other people. Uh, and I'm acknowledging that uh, there's a sense here uh, that, the, that the White House uh, should have sent somebody with a higher profile to the march. Jim. Uh, so what you're saying is that the White House made a mistake. I just want to make, make that clear. You haven't used that well, word. Well, I mean, if we should have, I, I, essentially I'm suggesting that we should have done something differently, so I think it's fair for you to assess that. The President believe that the White House made a mistake? Uh, I, I, have not, uh, I have not spoken to the President about this specific matter. And you said that this uh, decision did not reach his level. Doesn't the did buck not. stop with the President? It always does. He'd be the first to tell you that. Yeah. So, so why wasn't this decision brought to him? Well, Jim, I'm not going to sort of unpack the, the planning and logistics that go into uh, these kinds of decisions. Why not? Uh, well, just because uh, that'd be pretty complicated. Uh, maybe There's not. an interagency failure, perhaps the, no, the White I, House was not talking about I, this. I mentioned in response to Major's question that the responsibility lays here at the White House for finding uh, appropriate representation uh, at the march. We certainly were pleased that the U.S. Ambassador to France could participate in that march. That sends an important signal, too. The President's travel to the French Embassy here in the United States sends a pretty important symbol. Uh, the President telephoning his French counterpart on the day of the attacks uh, and offering up his condolences on behalf of the American people and pledging uh, his uh, any needed assistance and cooperation, uh, I think makes it pretty clear to everybody who's paying attention uh, that the United States and this administration sh stands shoulder to shoulder with our allies in France at this time. And the Secretary of State earlier today said this was a, a bit of quibbling. So I, 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 I suppose what you're saying is that he's wrong in that assessment. Uh, it sounds like you're getting me to quibble with his remarks. Yeah, quibbling with his quibbling. Um, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, certainly the Secretary of State is somebody who um, uh, has very important responsibilities himself.
Uh, he was in India this past weekend um, doing some important work representing U.S. interests there. Uh, I'll also note that at the conclusion of his trip to India, he made an unannounced visit to Pakistan, where he is right now. Uh, and while in Pakistan, he actually visited the school in Peshawar that was the site of the terrible terrorist attack uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I think uh, the pres the, in the same way that high-profile representation at the march uh, and the president's decision to go to the French embassy in Washington shows U.S. solidarity with the French people as they confront terrorism, I think the Secretary of State's visit to this school demonstrates the American people's solidarity with the people of Pakistan as they face down extremism and violence and terrorism in their own country. And not to belabor this because it's been belabored, but, <laughs> but the vice president was, was sitting at home all weekend. Presumably he could have gone. Uh, yeah, so was the president. Um, what was pressing Wilmington, and, uh, Delaware this weekend? And just to, to uh, follow up on, on Major's question about images of the Prophet Muhammad, should Americans be fearful of how they depict the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, no, the American people should. Uh, should they be able to depict how, uh, however they see fit? Without question. There is no, again, there is no expression uh, of public opinion or viewpoint or perspective that in any way justifies a terrible act of violence like this. There's none. There's no justification for it. This is a terrible act of violence. It's an act of terrorism, and it's an assault on the kinds of values that we hold dear in this country and the kinds of values that they hold dear in France. And, you know, I, I think for some people it's a, it, it serves to be a cliché that when our men and women in uniform uh, are fighting alongside our allies uh, in far-flung lands, that they're not just fighting for our security, they're fighting for our values. I think this is a pretty good illustration of that. Uh, and that's why we certainly value the kind of contribution that the French people have made uh, to taking on uh, ISIL. You know, we have not had a chance to talk yet about the leading role that France has played in taking on um, AQIM uh, in North Africa, uh, that there is French expertise and a legacy there where French military forces have been very effective uh, in applying pressure to terrorist leaders in North Africa. Uh, that uh, have ambition for attacking uh, France and other Western interests. Uh, so again, you know, we, uh, you know, we value the kind of strong relationship that the United States has with France. And uh, there's no doubt in the mind of this president, there certainly is no doubt in the mind of the French ambassador to the United States, uh, that the American people will continue to be stalwart allies with France uh, as we face down those terrorists that try to use violence to attack our basic values. And in uh, dealing with this oversight, does President have any plans to call uh, President Hollande? Uh, have, have any communications been made from the White House to the French to say we screwed up on this one? Well, again, based on the, uh, the public expression and public comments from the French ambassador, I'm not sure that's necessary. Uh, but if it is, the French ambassador will be sitting down with the President's top uh, Homeland Security Advisor here at the White House today. It may be taking place right now. Uh, and if that's necessary, I'm confident that will be conveyed. And then you can communicate it. Okay. All right. Julie. A couple things. Um, first, just back on Paris for a second. Mm -hmm. I'm told the Secret Service was not asked about the potential security concerns around a vice presidential or a presidential visit mm -hmm. to Paris around the march. So are you saying that's inaccurate? Or what, what should we conclude from that? What, was this about security or was it about something else? Well, uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, to clarify here. The, uh, I'm not going to get into the, the, the planning or logistics that went into the decision uh, related to the march. Uh, what I have merely reiterated uh, is something that we have talked about on many occasions uh, and applies to every time the President wants to attend uh, an event alongside uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of other people, which is that that requires significant uh, onerous security precautions. Uh, that necessarily have an impact on the ability of those who are attending that event to fully participate. Uh, and there is no doubt that had the President uh, attended that march on short notice yesterday, uh, it would have had an, th the security uh, precautions around his uh, attendance and participation would have had an impact on uh, those who uh, attended the march. You said this was not a decision that was made by the president himself, but he is the president of the United States. If he had decided that this was a priority for him to be there in Paris for this march, he, he could have, ostensibly, he could have come forward and said that. Does he personally regret not saying, you know, I really want to be there for this. It's the reason that I called the French president immediately after these attacks and I should be there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Julie, I haven't. I, I didn't talk to him about uh, about his personal regret. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, here at the White House, uh, we do believe that we should have sent somebody with a higher profile to the march beyond just the U.S. ambassador to France. Specifically on the meeting tomorrow with congressional leaders, mm -hmm. it's week two of the Congress. You guys have already issued, I guess it's three veto threats, the most recent of which just at the top here. Mm -hmm. What is the President's message going to be to congressional leaders at this meeting tomorrow, who the Republicans at least seem to feel like he's not starting off on a great foot with them given his veto threats? Mm -hmm. And, and how, how is he going to explain that? The well, I'll say a couple things about that, Julie. The first off is none of the veto threats that uh, you've heard from us in the last week or so has it all been a surprise, uh, particularly because the uh, pieces of legislation that we're talking about uh, are pieces of legislation in which the administration already had well-known views. So while it may raise questions in the minds of some Republicans about the President's willingness to work uh, with Republicans in Congress to advance uh, uh, priorities, uh, it might also raise questions in the mind of some others that Republicans have chosen as their first few pieces of legislation bills that they know the President opposes. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, despite those disagreements, there is a, another important principle here, and this is something that the President has articulated uh, on several occasions, particularly since the midterm elections. We can't allow a disagreement over a handful of issues to become a deal breaker over all the others. There's a lot of important work that needs to get done. Uh, and whether that's reforming our tax code to make it more fair and more simple, uh, or investing in the kinds of uh, infrastructure projects that we know are going to create jobs over the long term and lay the foundation for a modern infrastructure that will benefit everybody, including our economy. Uh, it could be, you know, working together to open up uh, overseas markets for American businesses. There are a whole host of things that we could do uh, by working with Republicans. It doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. Certainly we're not. Uh, but the question is, are we going to allow disagreement over a few things uh, to become a deal breaker for all the others? The President certainly hopes that it won't. Uh, and that will be something they'll discuss uh, at the meeting quite a bit tomorrow. Okay. Scott. Back in his 2010 state of the Union, the President said he would have meetings like this on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. I know you don't read out every time the President meets with legislative leaders, but it seems like he's fallen short of that total. Well, we're in the first month of the year, and they're going to have their first meeting tomorrow. So it depends on where you draw the line, right? <laughs> uh, admittedly, I would, I would say that the um, – uh, I don't think that the meetings – the formal meetings certainly haven't been that frequent. Uh, I was asked about this last week, I think. Uh, in which I declined to suggest that we would set up uh, a similar sort of artificial standard. Uh, but I do think that you can uh, expect the President to be in regular touch with leaders on Capitol Hill, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, in pursuit of the kind of common ground that we believe is necessary to move the country forward. And again, it doesn't mean we're going to agree over everything. I don't want to paper over the differences because the differences are significant. Uh, but the President's determined to try to work with Republicans where he can to try to find common ground. And where they can't, the President's going to be prepared to use all of the elements of his executive authority uh, to move us uh, forward on his own. And uh, the President made that uh, pretty evident uh, in the uh, uh, last few days of uh, – or last few weeks of 2014. And I think even here in the early stages of uh, 2015, he's been pretty clear about that, too. Is the size of the group tomorrow a little unwieldy? Um, not necessarily. I think this can be a – uh, an appropriate forum for discussion where we can have a, you know, a sizable number of congressional leaders all in one room, sitting down, putting their heads together to, uh, to try to find and identify some areas of common ground. And I think those kinds of uh, discussions are constructive. Um, I, I think what you're pointing out is that often it's hard to reach a final agreement on something when you have a large number of people in the room. I wouldn't anticipate that any final agreements will be reached on any uh, momentous pieces of legislation in this meeting. but. You know, after all, we're seven days into the new Congress. So, uh, but I do anticipate that there will be a very useful discussion. Uh, and the President certainly hopeful that Democrats and Republicans from Capitol Hill will uh, participate in the same meeting in which uh, – or the, participate in the meeting in the same spirit uh, that the President will bring to the meeting, which is a, a spirit of cooperation uh, and optimism uh, about the country, certainly about the, the progress that we have made on the economy. Uh, and optimistic about our ability to try to put aside political differences and focus on those areas uh, where, there, where common ground exists and we can make progress uh, for every, uh, everybody here in the country. Okay. Yes. Chris. Thanks, Jeff. Obviously, uh, if the White House had made a different decision, schedules can be changed, whether it's Eric Holder or mm -hmm. uh, John Kerry. Did the White House underestimate the symbolic importance of this march? Well, to the extent that anybody had an opportunity to estimate it in 36 hours, um, I think what you can say is that um, 
that this kind of symbolism is important. That, after all, is why we sent the uh, U.S. ambassador to France uh, and why uh, we believe that we should have sent somebody with an even higher profile, that those kinds of expressions of uh, uh, symbolic solidarity are meaningful in the same way that it was meaningful for the president to go to the French embassy here in Washington last week uh, and write a thoughtful note uh, in, a, uh, in a book at the embassy ex expressing uh, his profound sorrow at those who are lost and uh, his resolve to working with the people of France uh, to protect our values and to protect our livelihood. And uh, those expressions of uh, 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 the symbolic expressions are important and uh, they certainly were important yesterday too. And is that why John Kerry is going on Thursday and Friday? Well, you'd have to talk to him about his schedule. I think that they have, had been talking about uh, him doing that on the end of his India and Pakistan trip anyway. Uh, but again, you'd have to check with them to, to confirm whether or not that's the case. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Let me ask about the CENTCOM uh, breach just a little bit. You mentioned that there is obviously a difference between a data breach and, and hacking Twitter. But when you talk to intelligence officials, one of the things they'll tell you is that the power of some of these radical groups have been their PR successes. And the idea that CENTCOM is being hacked at the same time that the president is talking about cybersecurity at the FTC, was this a PR coup for them? No. Cheryl. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Can I follow up on that? Sure. Uh, well, sure, Cheryl, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, the, and, and also in sort of saying that, that this uh, was uh, less significant, there have been some reports in, uh, that, that there was personal information that was divulged, names, phone yeah. numbers, those kinds of things. Obviously not classified information on a right. Twitter feed, but does that make it significant? Uh, it certainly makes it something that we would take seriously. But again, I, the, the scope of this uh, particular incident is something that's still under investigation, or at least it was when I, still, when I walked out here uh, an hour or so ago. So maybe they made some more progress to determine what exactly has happened. Uh, but we'll certainly keep you up to date on this, and this is something that will uh, attract uh, prominent attention in the administration because it's something that we take seriously. Okay. Cheryl, back to you. Thanks. On Friday, the uh, White House received a reauthorization for the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. Will the President sign that bill? Mm -hmm. uh, the President will sign that bill. We have made clear our um, disappointment that on this critically important piece of legislation, legislation that's good for our economy and good for national security, uh, included a, uh, a writer that would uh, try to water down one element of, uh, of Wall Street reform. And that's certainly something that we are um, not happy about. Uh, but again, in this era of trying to compromise, uh, the President on occasion is going to have to sign important pieces of legislation uh, that aren't 100 percent to his liking. Um, and I think uh, the, the signing of this piece of legislation is one example of that. Uh, we'll let you know when that bill's gotten signed. Okay. Thank Mike. Um, just, um Jim had an interesting question, even though he left, and I was struck by your exchange. Okay. Um, he asked you, should American media organizations be fearful of reprinting these cartoons or depicting Muhammad in some way that, you know, violent extremists don't like? And there has been, and you answered about the talk about American values. There have, has been some discussion that American media organizations haven't reprinted some of these things deliberately because they're afraid, you know, some terrorists could come in and shoot them up. Uh, are you saying that, based on your knowledge, the White House, you guys know a thing or two about security, um, that American media organizations shouldn't be afraid of writing something or uh, showing a cartoon that would offend uh, jihadis because, hey, you, as the White House say, America's a place where you don't have to be afraid of that because we have sufficient security here. I just wanted to yeah. understand, because there's been this big debate in media circles about this, right. and it sounded like you were starting to address, hey, your fears may be overblown. We're assuring you we have this under control. Well, there's a lot there. Let me, let me try to go through this uh, carefully. The, the first thing is, I think that there are any number of reasons that media organizations have made a decision not to, re to, to reprint the cartoons. In some cases, Maybe they were concerned about their physical safety. Uh, in other cases, they were uh, express, uh, exercising some judgment uh, in a different way. Um, so we certainly would leave it to media organizations to make a decision like this. Uh, I think this goes to something I was saying earlier, that there is a responsibility associated with the exercise of some of these First Amendment rights. Uh, and, but that is a, a decision uh, that should be made by uh, those 
news organizations. It's a separate decision from being fearful. That's a taste, judgment, you know. Well, I, again, I, I think that's probably in their minds, and I hesitate to speak for them, but since we're going down this road, I'll try to uh, entertain this dialogue here. They're trying to assess some risk, right? They're trying to understand at what risk is it going to put uh, this organization uh, or our employees uh, by publishing this cartoon. Now, I'm confident in saying that for the vast majority of media organizations, that's, that's not the only factor, uh, but I would readily concede that it is one in the minds of many of those news executives. But again, that is a decision for all of them to make. What the responsibility uh, that this president feels is um, on a couple of fronts. The first is to reiterate, as I have here a few times, but I'm going to do it again because it's important, a, a basic principle here, which is that no public expression or exercise of free speech justifies violence. Certainly not violence on the scale that we saw in Paris last week. And that is a, a, a principle that, is, um, that the President believes is uh, really important and one worth fighting for. Uh, and I think you could make the case, as I mentioned earlier, that a lot of men and women in uniform, uh, not just from uh, American soldiers, but French, French soldiers and British soldiers and others, uh, are fighting for that principle in a very real way. And uh, that is, uh, you know, a testament to the close uh, alliance that we have with uh, the French and with others. Yeah, but when you said no to Jim, you weren't making a risk assessment that, that there shouldn't be fear that, that, you know, if the New York Times or Bloomberg printed this cartoon that we would all be killed. That you're not making a, a risk assessment when you're saying you shouldn't fear that. No, uh, what I'm saying is that individual news organizations have to uh, assess that risk for themselves. Uh, I mean, look, I might add that there are also uh, journalists who assume great personal risk to tell these stories. Uh, and we've seen that some of these uh, journalists uh, have been captured by violent extremists who have carried out terrible acts of violence against them. Uh, so there is, a, um, there, there is a risk assessment uh, made in lots of decisions that journalists make. Uh, and again, I think the point in the mind of the President, and certainly everybody here at the White House, uh, is that that is a uh, question that should be answered by journalists. They should use their independent professional judgment uh, to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, and again, those decisions aren't just driven by safety. They're also driven by uh, certain uh, ethics uh, and journalistic standards. Uh, and those are, these are complicated issues, but ultimately ones uh, that the journalists should make. Uh, I will say that you know, there have been an occasion, there have been occasions, and somebody mentioned it earlier, I guess it was Major, uh, where, you know, the United, uh, where the administration will make clear our, our point of view on some of those assessments based on the need to protect the American people and to protect our men and women in uniform. Uh, and so I wouldn't rule out making those kinds of uh, expressions uh, again. But again, it's, th this is, these are the kinds of difficult questions that, that journalists have to wrestle with. Uh, there may be an occasion where uh, U.S. government officials can be helpful in providing them advice or information that can help them make that decision, but ultimately uh, the decision rests with them, and regardless of what decision is made, uh, it does not in any way justify an act of violence. Jared, I'm going to give you the last one. Well, then, then a fun one then, Josh, for you. Okay. Uh, that would be the first one that's going to <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, that's okay. After the 2012 re-election, the President said he was going to reach out to Governor Romney. Uh, mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal reporting that Governor Romney's putting out some 2016 trial balloon. Has the President, in any conversation or meeting, had any interaction with the Governor since their lunch in November 2012? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't recall any uh, conversation that they've had since that lunch. Yeah, okay. All right. One, 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 Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.